1, 2, 3, test. 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 Test. 1, 2, 3. Ale nikt właśnie nie będzie tutaj mówił. 1, 2, 3, test. Test. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, test.
Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Renata Kim. I'm a journalist of Newsweek Polska Weekly, and I will be honored to moderate this public discussion, uh, which is organized as part of the conference on the future of Europe. We'll be talking about hate speech and polarization and uh, the ways we can prevent those phenomena um, locally with the support of the European Union. Um, let me introduce our distinguished speakers. Rafał Trzaskowski, the mayor of Warsaw, and also a member of the European Committee of Regions and the Board of Eurocities. Aleksandra Dulkiewicz, mayor of the city of Gdańsk, and Bartłomiej Balcerzyk, lawyer, head of communication section in the European Commission's representation in Poland. We are all in the studio here. And online, Christian Specht, the deputy mayor of the city of Mannheim and vice president of the European Forum for Urban Security, EFUS. Benedek Javor, head of representation of Budapest to the EU and former member of the European Parliament. Jan Olbricht, member of the European Parliament and president of the Urban Intergroup. Good morning, everyone. And now let me ask uh, President Rafał Trzaskowski to give the um, introduction and the welcoming words. Hello, w welcome to Warsaw. It's wonderful to be with uh, friends and among friends and uh, to be able to discuss this very important topic that is very high on the agenda of uh, our cities, that is very high on the agenda of the European Union. When we talk about uh, polarization, when we talk about hate speech, uh, we need to start uh, with uh, what's happening now in a geopolitical context because unfortunately the situation in uh, eastern Ukraine is uh, getting more and more serious. We have heard the announcement of President Putin, which is going to uh, actually uh, bring even more destabilization of the region, but also we are observing things that uh, are very worrying for us uh, because we see uh, a lot of disinformation in the net and on the internet, which is uh, also trying to polarize the society on the issue. And it so happens that uh, when we observe what's happening in Poland, exactly the same websites that uh, for the past months were disseminating information uh, uh, about vaccine, anti-vaccine information now switched into attacking Ukraine, which uh, gives us food for thought, to put it mildly but of course uh, points to the direction of uh, governments which are being involved in actually promulgating uh, hate speech, polarization and disinformation. We do have a problem in Europe and I remember that uh, 10, 20 years ago when social media were entering uh, the political domain, we thought that they're going to actually help democracy, that they're going to allow us to disseminate uh, more uh, messages, that they are going to uh, allow uh, different groups uh, to be heard on the internet, that they are going to uh, strengthen the voice of the citizens, and that they are going to strengthen, most importantly, the possibility of uh, getting acquainted with uh, all kinds of uh, points of view, of different points of view. Unfortunately, we see that uh, there is a flip side to it, and this flip side to it is even uh, more dangerous, uh, where we have incredible polarization, where we have hate speech, uh, where we have uh, politicians who get entrenched in their views, and we all are closed in our own bubbles that actually reinforce uh, our point of view instead of allowing us to be confronted with the other points of view. And by the way, this is not a thing which uh, cannot be reversed, because social media work according to certain algorithms. And those algorithms now are set to mostly create benefit for the companies that have created those algorithms. And of course, conflict sells better. So it is also our responsibility in the European Union, the responsibility of the decision makers to do something about it because this is not the reality that can be changed when it comes to how social media operate. And of course, 
the situation when it comes to polarization, when it comes to hate speech is very serious everywhere and it threatens the very essence of a democracy. And wherever you look, if you look at uh, Brazil, if you look at uh, the United States of America, if you look at uh, Europe, the problems are the same. Of course, the degree is different because it all depends on the government and how democratic it is, but we do have that problem everywhere in the world. And it has to be dealt with uh, internationally and it has to be also dealt with uh, in the European Union because of course this is closest to our heart. Now the problem is even more serious where democracy is under attack, such as it is in Poland, such as it is in Hungary and in quite a few other countries, where the government itself is using some of those, some of those tools in order to garner support and in order to increase polarization. And that's exactly happening in my country, where all the instruments of the state are used against the opposition, where the rule of law is being violated, and where the government is taking away uh, the powers of the local government, and where non-governmental organizations which are fighting with <coughs> A hate speech, which are fighting with polarization, which are fighting with domestic violence, which are helping minorities, are under attack. Which, of course, brings uh, the local government, the regional government, and the cities into the picture. Because in Poland and Hungary and in many other countries, it is us who take upon ourselves the responsibility to deal with those problems. Because when financing is taken away from all of those who are dealing with hate speech, are dealing with domestic violence, and so on and so forth. Uh, it is our responsibility to step in and do something about it. And the problem is quite serious. Uh, if we talk about the young people, even the data shows, and we have the data from Poland, which shows that at least 32 or 35% of young people uh, were attacked on the net, were the victims of uh, hate speech. And when you actually ask them, uh, if they observed it on the net, almost 60% of the young people in Poland admit that they have seen instances of hate speech and that they've seen people being attacked. Of course, hate speech is now in a penal code, but it turns out that it is not prosecuted very often. In Poland itself, it's uh, one-tenth of a percent of all the cases which are brought in front of the tribunals which actually deal with that problem. That's why we need to do something about it. We need to do something about it on a city level, on a regional level, and of course within the European Union, and that's why I'm so happy that we can talk about it in this context. In Warsaw, we do as much as we can. We support the NGOs which fight hate speech, which fight domestic violence, which support minorities, especially that the funding for these NGOs were taken away by the uh, government. We do it actively. We organize classes at schools where we talk about discrimination, where we talk about hate speech, when we teach tolerance, which is not, of course, it's not easy, and the current Minister of Education is trying to curtail it and then trying to uh, bring in indoctrination in schools and forbid such activities, which, by the way, of course, are voluntary, and uh, they would never happen if they were not supported by students and teachers and and, uh, and parents. Uh, we support minorities, all the minorities that are under attack. We've, for example, we've created a shelter for the LGBTQ community in order to be practical about our help. We practically fight hate speech when we see, for example, the instances of it, like the posters which have been plastered all over the city, we take them down, even if these posters are about the members of the current government because we think that that's the way it should be done in the city itself. And most importantly, we talk to the young people and we offer them help, psychological help, sometimes even more serious, because sometimes you need a psychiatrist. And of course, this is a problem in all of our cities and all of our countries, that the instances of problems connected to, uh, to the victim or the vi victimization of people are very serious and of course we do not have enough psychologists or psychiatrists who are trained for it and who uh, work 
with uh, children and who work with teenagers. But that's what we are trying to do. And again, we step in where the government is not taking action. So summing up, this is one of the most important problems that is before us. Uh, the European Union started dealing with it with both misinformation, with questions of hate speech, polarization and so on and so forth. But we need to do it on the local level. We need direct financing for all of those who are dealing with it. Because if we do care about our democracy, we cannot simply uh, be idle uh, about those threats that are undermining uh, the open nature of our societies. And I hope that we can talk about it today. Thank you again for, uh, for coming to also or for being with us online. And y yet again, let me remind uh, yourself and ourselves that we are talking about it in very difficult geopolitical situation which also is impacted by misinformation, by hate speech, and uh, by all of those trends that are making our life even more difficult. But I wanted to end with an optimistic note. It's not that we cannot do anything about it. We can, and we should, and we are. Because these trends, these mechanisms that actually allow for uh, hate speech uh, to work and to be disseminated can be changed. So let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now we'll go to the round of introductory questions. And um, each of the speakers will have five minutes to explain his position on the uh, topic. And I would like to ask you a very general question. Why is the role of local authorities of crucial importance uh, to taming and preventing and mitigating hate speech? And I would like to start with uh, Mrs. Alexandra Durke Durkevich, the mayor of Gdańsk. Uh, the city which is um, overshadowed by hate speech and uh, very tragic incident of uh, murdering the former president. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here in Warsaw today um, and take a part um, during this, uh, this debate. Well, I'm representing not only my own city, city of Gdansk, but I'm also representing Union of Polish Metropolis, where we are together, the 12 biggest uh, cities. Um, so we definitely see the deep need of working on a hate speech, on working on a hate crimes. Um, not only because of this, what had happened three years ago um, in Gdansk, what you have uh, mentioned before, but we can see very easily, even opening the, the newspaper, the media, and the internet, that um, hate speech is part of, the, uh, of our everyday, everyday life. Um, we definitely see the role of local um, authorities um, in several fields. One is definitely education, and education meant not only the one we have at schools, which is of course extremely important. Uh, Maya Traskowski had just said a little bit about the changes of Polish law which we are hoping that will not uh, be the case. Uh, we are still waiting for the signing um, the new law uh, by the, by the uh, President Andrzej Duda, but we'll see what will happen. Uh, but, for example, I can give you a very brief example of this, what we are trying to do in my city in Gdansk. We have Gdansk uh, civic classes, and this is the program which is um, which was prepared by non-governmental organizations, but together with the teachers. So we trained the teachers to do those classes so that even if this new law will uh, come into force, um, this could happen and this will be a legal way. So we have really well prepared program which is um, divided for uh, different groups which could be also organized in kindergarten, then in primary school, in lower classes, higher classes and, um, and high school. Uh, maybe not always directly in talking about tolerance, human rights and so on and so on, but the one which could um, help us to be um, 
open person, but also the person who can realize really what is happening all around in the world. And this is actually something what I'm, what I'm really dreaming to be my, my daughter like and our children like. And I do hope that Polish uh, young people could have this chance to, um, to get that sort of education. Another example uh, also which we could put um, into this educational field are uh, our campaigns we are just uh, we just started this year a campaign in my city Gdansk city of equality but we are showing different people elder people people who are disabled people who uh, came uh, like uh, we have a woman who arrived to Poland five years ago from uh, Crimea with four children and one luggage and now she's a businesswoman in Poland being a Muslim uh, so we are trying to show positive examples of different people who are part of our society but um, before this campaign we um, did some researches some survey and some Something what was really struggling to me was that almost 70% of people mm, say that hate speech is one of the way of expressing the opinion. So it shows that we really have a lot to do, not only in Gdansk, not only here in Poland, but in general we can also see it uh, in Europe and I do hope that my colleagues will maybe mm, say a little bit more on that. What is important, the European Commission uh, just prepared the document to, um, to put two crimes, hate speech and hate crime, as a those two who will be also a crime in the uh, in the European Union in Europe. Um, I just uh, will prepare a report uh, in the name of Committee of Regions, so uh, showing from the local perspective what we do think about it. So definitely there is a lot to do. We definitely need education, uh, and this is uh, the same role for us as a mayors, not only in the big cities, but also at the all levels of local and regional government, both national level, and this is quite difficult in Poland, but definitely we need the support also from the European, European level. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to turn to Mr. Benedek Javor from um, Budapest, because um, um, Poland and Hungary are always pointed to as countries where we have a real problem with the rise of hate speech. And um, the hate speech is not only uh, inspired by the um, government and the ruling party. Uh, and how do you cope with that? And how on a local level uh, do you try to prevent and mitigate hate speech? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question and uh, for the opportunity to, to be with all of you today um, uh, to talk about this extremely important issue. And, and exactly, uh, I, I completely agree what you posed in your question and I completely agree with uh, Mayor Traskowski that the situation in Hungary and in Poland is a bit special. Uh, because here, um, the hate speech and polarization is not initiated um, or experienced in, in marginal uh, social communities, but it's the main political program uh, of uh, our national governments. Um, so the pressure on uh, the public discourse is um, extremely strong uh, because it's um, genuinely and deeply transformed by very strong government uh, uh, propaganda and communication uh, to form it in a way that, uh, that the public discourse is based on hate speech and, and polarization. And um, I think that in, in a situation like this, uh, the role of the local governments is extremely important simply because nothing else is left. Uh, when the government is, is doing um, a, a hate speech and, and using polarization for political purposes, I think that local governments are uh, the, the last um, refuges for us uh, to do something else 
and uh, to try to tackle and to resist uh, this pressure uh, from, from our national government. Um, first of all, I think that it's very important to, to lead with example. So on the local level, we have to stand firmly against hate speech and not to jump in, because that's uh, the plan of the government and, and the strategy of the government to, to provoke us into uh, this circle of hate and uh, to use the same uh, methods and, and same measures uh, um, in, in public communication. And it's very important to resist to this temptation and uh, to stay firm, uh, firmly behind our fundamental values of um, uh, tolerance, of, um, um, of uh, diversity, and uh, of dialogue uh, between the sides. And uh, I think that what we can do is, is really to um, give an example of a very different way of um, practicing democracy. Um, and to make a participative democracy a living practice in, in our, our cities. Because very often, heat speech and polarization comes from uh, non-understanding of, of each other, because we simply don't know what the other side or other people are, are thinking. And uh, it makes very easy to dig gaps or trenches between us and them. And in a situation like this, I think it's extremely important to keep alive uh, the dialogue and the discussion of different and and I, I wouldn't accept uh, the simple formulation of having two sides. I think that in a country and, and in a local community there are always many sides and we have to keep alive the dialogue between the, the different sides. So participative democracy which we uh, have as a practice in, in Budapest and we have a participative budgeting uh, process, we involved um, the citizens through um, citizens um, uh, juries and, and citizens, citizens assemblies uh, to create a, a number of uh, official documents including the climate strategy and so on and so forth. But also it's important to openly um, uh, standing uh, firmly and representing strongly our values of tolerance, dialogues and, and diversity. Like um, uh, the mayor of Budapest uh, always uh, stands behind uh, the minorities under pressure, including LGBTQI community or the Roma community or even women. Uh, so, for example, he always participate on the uh, at the pride, uh, and uh, we have a very strong cooperation uh, with the with the Roma uh, community. Um, and um, last but not least, I think that it's always very important to to cooperate with all the possible partners to step up against uh, um, hate speech and polarization. Uh, perhaps the most important ones are the the NGOs. Uh, civil society, cultural institutions are, are extremely important uh, to promote the culture of tolerance, but also, as it was already mentioned in the um, 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 example of Gdansk, uh, education um, is the first step uh, where we can um, have uh, good results and effective results against uh, uh, hate speech and, and uh, polarization. But last uh, but not least, also the international cooperation. And I think that from this perspective, uh, the Pact of Free Cities, which was signed by the mayors of the uh, four uh, Visegrad um, capital cities uh, in 2019, is a very good example that uh, mayors belonging to different political camps can work together uh, and can share a lot of values and uh, can represent the region of the Visegrad countries uh, on the European level as well uh, to promote the values of tolerance, cooperation and um, uh, the further uh, improvement of, of fundamental European uh, values. So I think that also on the international level uh, and on the European level, um, the local uh, communities, cities, municipalities have a lot of opportunity to cooperate with each other and also to cooperate with the European Union. Thank you very much. And now I would like to turn to Mr. Christian Specht, the Deputy Mayor of the City of Mannheim, and also the Vice President of the European Forum for Urban Security. Um, can you give us any 
precise and concrete examples of good practices of preventing hate speech on a local level? Uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, first of all, I, I want uh, to uh, thank you to Warsaw and uh, the Union of Polish Metropolis and also of EFUS for giving us the opportunity to participate, but also to discuss these uh, important questions, especially in these times. And um, I'm uh, with the mayor uh, from Warsaw, Draszkowski, that our thoughts in the moment are with our colleagues in the Ukraine. For example, Mannheim, we have a close contact to Czernowitz, and um, uh, we are in contact with the mayor of Czernowitz in the Ukraine. And um, therefore, this discussion is also maybe a, 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 little, a little bit of a process to strengthen the necessity and uh, the importance uh, of local de democracy for, uh, for the freedom in whole Europe. So, thanks a lot. Um, again, uh, as Deputy Mayor, I'm responsible for urban sa safety and security, as well for finance, for example. And so we try to bring together um, also in AFUS the perspective that combines both the local problem detection, uh, for example, by surveys, um, scientific surveys, and solving as well as the importance of cross-border cooperation and transfer of knowledge when dealing with hate speech, polarization, and, and crime prevention. So, um, hate speech and polarization are indeed important issues that need to be addressed because of the growing number of cases all over in Europe. But uh, as uh, Mr. Truskowski uh, mentioned, there is a positive um, impact that um, we can do something, and especially in cities we can do something, because we are in direct contact with the with the people, and all crimes have a local component. There cannot, cannot be any legal vacuum, especially not online. And local authorities must, vis must be visible in everyday life. Um, also vice versa, polarization and violent extremism is most visible on the local level. So, for example, we observed in um, different um, uh, programs with AFUS that hate speech is increasingly personalized as well as increasingly quickly distributed by via social media. Because social media isn't as linked to a local community as, for example, a regional newspaper, hate speech reaches and is distributed by people that neither know the person nor circumstances and facts that is being referenced in hate speech. The resulting narratives connect individual politicians and public office holders to events and suggest a form of responsibility for misconduct that they're either not responsible for or that cannot factually be described as misconduct. So in order to meet these challenge, specific projects and actions are necessary. So I want to say four conclusions a little bit. In their development, cooperation with other cities is essential to be able to use and apply existing solutions. So thanks for your work already and for your examples in Gdansk, uh, Budapest and in Warsaw. The EU plays an important and appreciated role in facilitating this cooperation. So therefore, EU funding is very crucial especially when cities cannot rely on full support of their state or national government, like you mentioned it for Poland or for Hungary. So we need a direct funding way from EU funds to cities to install these programs and to assist your initiatives. Union of Polish Metropolis and European Forum for Urban Security, EFUS, are, in my opinion, perfect examples of city-to-city -city cooperation without the involvement of the national government. And therefore, I want to only to mention, for example, the project Bridge, uh, but we can discuss it also a little bit uh, later. This gives us a very good impression about how we can work together 
uh, to reduce polarization and growing extremism. This was a project uh, that took place between 2019 and 2021. The EU also helped fund this project and it gave us a, a common understanding uh, of what cities can do and what are the, the reasons for polarization and how we have to integrate polarization in our urban security policies. This is one of the examples, but there are a lot of others we can mention also later, um, which can help us a little bit better to understand this phenomenon and how we can um, work against it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And I would like to turn to Mr. Jan Olbricht now. Uh, we heard um, a lot of examples of uh, how the local authorities cope with the problem of hate speech. And I would like to ask you um, how uh, and what kind of help uh, could they expect from the European Union? Are there any specific programs to help local authorities to um, prevent hate speech and fight it? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, my best greetings from my, my city where I, when I uh, live and I, when I used to be the mayor. And uh, uh, when we speak about the hate speech, I think there are different elements. We have just had the meeting with EFUS, uh, our urban intergroup, a very interesting meeting concerning the relation between EU and the cities. And uh, when, when you look at the, uh, <clears throat> at the whole situation, I think it will be discussed also by the representative of the European Commission. But uh, let's, uh, let's be very clear. Uh, uh, when, when we speak about the hate speech, we are speaking about the crime. And that's why it's not by chance the European Commission just started to, to, uh, to introduce the hate speech as the EU crime. As all the, all the crimes, it, uh, we have to find the ways to, uh, to protect the people. So that's why it's not by, by chance that EFUS is doing it, because this is about security. This is about security. So the, the, uh, it's very important to identify the crime and to explain where is the origin and next to find the method and prevention. Of course, what about the European uh, plans and the European programs? I think that <clears throat> it should be done from one side, from the very clear uh, position of European Union, European Commission concerning the hate speech, wh whatever is the form, I mean, and to well define it as a crime, and next to, to push all the member states to, uh, to introduce all the methods which will facilitate. So I think this is on the uh, level of EU. I mean, what should be done between the EU and the governments and all the member states? As we see, uh, even from the former speakers, it's not very easy because very often in some of the countries, including mine, uh, 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 even the public uh, so-called national media are using hate speech to attack. So, um, uh, so I think this is, this is very difficult. And I think one thing is just to have the pressure from the uh, European level on the governments to, to, uh, to do everything uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to fight this crime, either hate speech as a crime. The other element is how uh, the cities can be helped. And I think it should be done by all the different programs which are coming using the, um, uh, the uh, European funds. I mean, it's from one side to, to, uh, to support all the initiatives, which we know, which is especially the, uh, um, the ideas of EFUS, the ideas of the very innovative elements of fighting, uh, fighting the crimes. Let's be very clear. The, in, the, in the cities, the, uh, the hate speech is not only in this, of social media, it's also in the streets. So I think that what Rafał Czaskowski explained it, they're on the walls, but not only. When you look at the different extreme manifestation or so-called marches, this is the hate speech which is in the streets. So I think that the, the, the cities should have the possibilities to protect the, the citizens. So I think that different uh, problems should be supported by the, uh, in, in supporting the uh, very innovating, the new methods um, uh, of fighting and trying to, to protect the, the people and to find the, uh, and to make the public spaces safe. Because very often the hate speech as a consequence has a, a problem of security. 
So that's why the, uh, it's the, the there are some in, in, uh, proposals for in new innovative ways of doing it. The other one are the, the, the funds which are going for everything which is uh, concert, uh, concentrated on education and uh, supporting all the uh, NGOs and of course all, all the elements. I mean, this is just uh, a positive element, supporting the these who are Fighting, uh, who are fighting for more uh, openness, tolerance, partnership, etc. So, but this is uh, it's possible, and it can be can be used with the uh, European Social Fund uh, uh, from European money. But they also should be the kind of negative elements. Like we have the example from Poland, my colleagues know very, know very well that the, when some of the uh, municipalities they created the the uh, some kind of the, uh, declaration concerning lgbti and it was exactly breaking the rule of law because it was introducing the discrimination which can produce the hate speech on the local level which can produce the lack of safety so uh, uh, and the reaction was very clear the reaction of the european institution was to stop money and of course to stop money is to react so I think when you ask me what should Europeans should uh, do is first to be very clear while defining the, the hate speech as a crime. Next, to support everybody who can uh, help to, to, to fight with this crime. And third, to react, to react, not to be passive, to be very clear and to react. And I think this is what you should do. And we are doing in the parliament everything to, to, to make it very clear. It's not very easy. Because we cannot concentrate only on the social media. We should concentrate on the uh, different kinds of hate speech, which can be really very dangerous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was already mentioned that in the year of 2020, President Ursula von der Leyen uh, proposed to extend the list of EU crimes to hate speech. And what should be the next steps to make this happen? And I'm turning to Mr. Bartłomiej Balcerzyk of the European Commission representative in Poland. Thank you. Um, I will uh, answer you directly to your, to your question and then I also uh, give you some, some my thoughts and remarks. Um, so indeed, in December, <coughs> Commission made this proposal to um, um, put uh, hate crimes uh, into the treaty to the, as a, as a, in, in the catalogue of serious crimes which needs to be tackled on European level because we consider that this type of crime with, his, with its cross-border uh, characteristics uh, and, and spread and um, the, the, the fast development needs to be tackled on European basis. And then as a next step, of course, this is discussed in the Council. It needs to be agreed with member states. And if, if we have it, we can then start through secondary legislation to introduce, for example, common definitions on hate crime or um, um, obligatory minimum sanctions in member states. So we can then address this issue via this particular tool jointly in a, in a more harmonized way. So this is where we are now. But let me come back to, uh, and give you some, um, I, will, I will keep five minutes. So uh, um, listen to, to, my, uh, um, to, to all speakers today. It came to my mind, I remember when I was working in Brussels, in DG Home and Migration, in Unit for Asylum in the time of the, the, the biggest asylum crisis. And then I could follow discussions with member states and other stakeholders and among, among others with cities. And it was cities which presented always the most creative and most forward-looking um, uh, solutions. Uh, they were, in my view, way ahead of member states in their proposals and tackling the challenge. So I, I was thinking, listen to you, um, I see that this uh, this again, this impulse um, is. Ex uh, I, I, I assume that it will come again from c cities. How to tackle this issue? Um, my uh, my boss, president of the commission, she said many times that there is no place for hate in Europe. 
Um, it, it's poisoned political debate and we need to tackle it jointly. I wanted to stress a couple of facts that one thing is that in this area of law, uh, EU cannot, cannot uh, act on its own. It does not have this exclusive responsibility and competence. It needs member states for it. So I, just, just to, for you to remember that. And what we can do, one is to, to set the legislative framework to set legislative framework to penalize, to prevent hate speech, and this was mentioned a couple of times by uh, uh, here among speakers. Another thing is the coordination, exchange of information, provision of, of uh, analysis, and um, here there are, I, I just give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is one of, uh, one is the uh, um, council working group on uh, prevention of hate speech within within the council, so so representatives of member states uh, dealing with this issue. Then, what ha hasn't been mentioned yet was uh, is the cooperation or trying to uh, uh, or uh, yeah, involvement of big IT companies, social media companies, to uh, also to work on this issue. And there is a code of conduct on countering illegal hate speech online, the EU code of conduct, where the main um, companies, you know them all, um, um, they, they uh, entered into it and we're working with them as well. Uh, and there's, there are, of course, EU agencies, which, for example, the, the, the uh, Fundamental Rights, Rights Agency or the agency dealing with with training of um, law enforcement officers. So these are, these are the, the um, actions of the EU on the level of um, cooperation, exchange of information, best practices. And finally, what um, Mr. Albrecht mentioned, it's the EU funding. This is also the way how we try to uh, tackle this challenge and this issue. And then, so we have these this tools and we need to act on different levels, and I'm coming closer to, to, to local authorities, because one of these levels, I mentioned member states, but also these are local authorities. And they can be our eyes and ears on the ground. They, they are closest to the, to the local groups, um, but also NGOs working locally. And that this is for us the best way of gathering information, also with local specificities of, of the um, possible hate speech. So they can the local authorities can help us to monitor the situation, to monitor how EU laws are implemented. Um, they can, of course, be engaged in projects funded by the EU. Um, they, there is also a possibility within this code of conduct for, for big IT companies, also to, for, for NGOs and local authorities to be more involved because the companies are obliged or they voluntarily uh, agreed that they will keep contact and um, um, trainings for so-called trusted flaggers. These are um, organizations which themselves check the internet and indicate to these companies that there is a hate speech. So um, also the place, uh, um, place for, for involvement. Um, I would say our approach and now coming back, coming a bit closer to Warsaw uh, representation, is we're trying to have a kind of bottom-up bottom approach. And an example of it is the Conference on the Future of Europe, which, which builds the framework of our today's meeting. This is a way how Commission wants to, to, to contact or to ask citizens, organizations, for their view how EU should look like in the future. And of course, one of the topics of the Conference on the Future of Europe uh, refers to values and rights of the EU. And there, um, uh, you can also give us recommendations what can be changed. Um, in Warsaw and, uh, and in, I'm sure in other offices throughout Europe, in other representations, we, can, we are open for uh, discussions and meetings with local authorities. We can support them from uh, little things like patronage, materials, 
providing experts on the issue, um, and also entering into possibilities for entering into, into kind of partnerships. And I stop here, thank you. Thank you. Um, we received uh, many questions uh, online, and I would like to uh, give the first of them, which seems very important to um, President Rafał Trzaskowski. Um, how can we reconcile the promotion of freedom of speech whilst fighting hate speech? Well, you know, th this is, those are the perennial questions for every democracy, you know, how to, how to square the circle between uh, freedom of speech and security, how to square the circle between the promotion of uh, free speech and hate speech, because it is very difficult sometimes to draw the boundaries. Because, of course, uh, we want the debate in, uh, in Poland and in Europe to be as open as possible, uh, and sometimes also controversial opinions uh, should be heard. Uh, but then we need to fight hate speech as such. So now the question is, you know, where to draw the boundaries? And that's, you know, we instinctively feel them ourselves because, of course, if a person is being attacked uh, personally or where we have those ideas to dehumanize uh, uh, certain people, certain politicians or certain minorities, we know what is it all about when we hear the President of the Republic talking about not people but ideology. Uh, that, of course, rings all the bells, because we all know that this is actually um, uh, said against people, not in order to uh, promote certain opinions. But it is very difficult, and that's why we need that debate. We need experts to engage. We need NGOs on the ground, uh, the people who deal with it every day, to have this open debate in order to, for us to, to try to draw those uh, boundaries, which, which is not easy. But let's just take an example of politics. You know, these boundaries have been crossed on so many occasions by the governments of Poland, of Hungary. I mean, of course, you can criticize the opposition, uh, for example, that it's not, you know, realistic enough, let's say. Uh, you can pinpoint mistakes and so on and so forth. But this debate has been personal. People have been personally attacked. Uh, there were lies and manipulations spread by uh, public media. I mean, one of the tragic examples is, of course, the mayor of Gdansk. I mean, how often was he attacked? How many manipulations? Uh, and it had nothing to do with uh, sp spreading information or writing or, or, or asking questions, because, of course, everyone has a right to ask questions about my actions, actions of the mayor of Gdansk but it's a question of personal attacks and, and, and misinformation and, and, and basically lies. Uh, and th that's why we need this debate to be, to be had, because you know, there are quite a lot of extremist groups who are always waving this flag of free speech, uh, but we, and, 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 and the government is supporting them, the government of the Polish government quite openly with huge sums of money. Uh, so that's why this, this debate is, is, is needed, because we're all for free speech, even for controversial ideas, uh, and for example, when it comes to the questions of uh, of anti-vaccination, it's it's also quite 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 important. But we need to be sure that the disseminated information is uh, is not simply manipulation and lies. And we have mechanisms to do it. I mean, look at the internet. I mean, many of those lies and manipulations are not opinions of people. These are generated mechanically by governments, by groups who pay a lot of money for it, by political parties. And there are tools available on the internet uh, that we can use in order to tell one from the other. We just need to have that willingness to pressurize some of the companies that are running these uh, websites, that are running these services, to actually be tough on those uh, who are disseminating information for political purposes and who have nothing to do with individual persons um, uh, actually voicing their, their opinions or voicing their doubts. Thank you. Uh, the next question is um, specifically about the tools to detect, detect the content and the level of hate discourses. And um, do you have any tools in Gdańsk you can detect and then use the knowledge to prevent hate speech? 
Well, um, I think that no one of us has a magic, uh, magic stick. Um, but um, as I just said before, I deeply believe in the role of education and not only the one we have at schools, but widely spread uh, social campaigns, education and so on and so on. I would just really support this, what uh, Mayor Traskowski just had said. Um, we definitely need to use those tools we have uh, in different social media uh, because this will help to create um, more um, aware communities uh, that if something is not true, is manipulated or is a hate speech, should be eliminated from, from, from the public life. Uh, but to have this, we really need to have aware, aware uh, citizens. And on the other hand, I, I deeply believe that we need to sh show good examples, posi positive examples, um, because um, this is something very difficult nowadays to spread positive message. Uh, so uh, I will just say uh, about one example, which is an um, Mayor Adamovic Award, which was created by the Committee of Regions. Icorn and uh, and the city of Gdansk. Um, it was established last last year and given uh, this year um, for the first time to the uh, mayor of um, of Köln, um, Mayor Henriette Ricker. Uh, so to just show the examples of the people, of the organizations, of the actions uh, that uh, can strongly. Um, be for values, no matter how high price they have to they have to pay. So um, I don't think that there is a single solution because all the actions, those which were mentioned by by Mr. Balcerzyk, uh, those mentioned by the. Um, Jan Olbricht and our colleagues from Germany and Hungary, this should be really great coalition uh, just to uh, create, to help us to be more aware as citizens all over the Europe. Thank you. And the next question uh, that we received, I would like to uh, um, direct to Mr. Benedek Javor of Hungary. Um, in your respective local context during COVID-19 pandemic, did you observe that hate discussions emerged? Has the pandemic accentuated polarization? Yes, um, uh, thank you. Um, in fact, uh, there was an interesting phenomenon we experienced during the pandemic and that um, um, some uh, specific groups um, found each other as, a, as allies and started to act together, uh, namely um, a quite strong anti-vax movement emerged uh, during the pandemic or at least uh, in the, the last uh, one year, past one year. And um, quite soon uh, the anti-vax movement found its um, links and uh, waves of cooperation with uh, the extreme right, um, um, political movements, parties, and, and, and groups. And um, it's becoming, I, I believe, it's becoming a more and more uh, threatening situation because um, many people uh, can be taken on board by uh, extreme right movements through anti-wax uh, campaigns and um, it's really I think that um, uh, the real problem uh, regarding um, extreme right populism and, and hate speech, extreme right hate speech is really when it's not uh, a kind of um, privilege of, of small um, uh, isolated groups but it's becoming uh, widely followed or, or supported or, or accepted. And uh, with the anti-vax movement um, um, as an ally, uh, the extreme right found its way to people who are not naturally standing on the, on the extreme right or not uh, necessarily racist or, or uh, xenophobic, 
but once uh, they are bought in uh, through the anti-wax uh, feelings or, or by the movement, the, the mindset and uh, how they think about the society can be transformed uh, by those extreme right groups. So that's one of the problems we experienced. The second is that um, um, in Hungary, perhaps it's not very well known, uh, even on the European level, in Hungary, we are living in a state of emergency since uh, 2015. Uh, then the, the government launched the state of emergency because of uh, mass migration and it was maintained um, in the past seven years in, in spite of the, the fact that uh, in the past few years hardly any migrants were, were uh, found in, in Hungary uh, or entered to Hungary. Uh, but uh, in, in addition to, to that, um, Right after the the start of the the pandemic, the government uh, launched an additional uh, state of emergency uh, because of the pandemic, uh, and uh, this um, makes two things possible for the government, which uh, I believe contribute uh, to uh, to hate speech and polarization. One is the, the legal consequences of that. So, for example, the access to information can be denied uh, by governmental uh, bodies um, with reference to the state of emergency uh, because of the pandemic. Or uh, some fundamental democratic rights uh, can be um, uh, rejected or, or withdrawn uh, with reference to the state of emergency. And on the other hand, also on the communication level, um, um, it made... Um, very easy to the government uh, to blame and accuse the opposition uh, political parties and movements, but also NGOs or or um, or, or uh, citizens movements or, or simple citizens who uh, were criticizing some moves or steps of the government as they are acting against the government, which is in fight uh, with the pandemic and uh, blaming the opposition uh, that they are betraying the country, they are traitors of the country, because they are not signing up um, uh, for the government's um, efforts um, uh, in the fight against uh, uh, the pandemic, even when uh, the cases which were uh, on the table or which were criticize, criticized by, by the opposition uh, were not uh, closely related to uh, to the uh, fight against the pandemic or the, the governmental efforts uh, of the pandemic, or the government used uh, the pandemic as um, a good curtain to hide uh, some bad, bad movements or some um, uh, quite um, 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 uh, corrupt uh, actions like uh, the Hungarian government um, purchased um, uh, some uh, medical equipment at the beginning of the, the pandemic for an extremely high price, which was uncomparable to, to any other uh, purchase on, on the market. They spent uh, 1 billion euros on that, uh, and those medical equipments were never used, uh, but some companies um, um, were very well paid who, who uh, conducted this, this purchase. And when um, even newspapers or the media questioned that how this was possible or what exactly happened, they were uh, very uh, shortly rejected and accused that they are attacking uh, the government, uh, which is uh, making the efforts um, uh, against uh, the pandemic. So even the, the government, and, and uh, to, to conclude and, um, and to, to cut it short, even um, uh, the pandemic was used to strengthen uh, the polarization and uh, the hate speech against uh, journalists, the independent media, against uh, the opposition and against uh, NGOs doing their the job to control the government. Thank you. And the next question that we received online will go to Mr. Christian Specht of Mannheim. Do you engage in EU-level cooperation, EU-financed projects and initiatives to learn from pure local authorities? Can you give us concrete examples? Uh, yes, um, thanks a lot. Uh, 
I already mentioned uh, one project. It's uh, the project Bridge, for example. Bridge means it's an acronym and uh, stands for Building Resilience to Reduce Polarization and Growing Extremism. And the EU, EU has helped fund this project. It's an EFUS project. It follows four steps. Understanding polarization, diagnosing polarization through local audits. I think that is a very important tool because very often we say the biggest advantage of cities is we are so close to our people. But if we are honest, we sometimes, and the pandemic has shown it, we don't know exactly what's going on in our districts and sometimes in special quarters and even in some streets. So the knowledge of the people of what's going on in our own cities, we have to improve this knowledge to uh, have a better diagnosis and also to better react and to react more effectively. So local audits, security audits are very, very important. And I can show you also an example how we learn from this project to uh, implement uh, not only an audit, but also to, uh, to, um, to uh, draw the consequences. Uh, third part was addressing polarization. So new innovative strategies of prevention and mitigation. And uh, the fourth part was integrating polarization in urban security policies, for example. So such a comprehensive urban security policy is key. Local authorities, key assignments, prevention and resilience building, continuous monitoring of polarizing dynamics and trends should be integrated um, into comprehensive urban security approaches and become a, a cornerstone of prevention policies at the local level. So for example, if we, in, in Mannheim, we try to re react as a consequence of the pandemic and of the hate speech um, uh, coming out of, uh, of anti-vaccination process uh, and so on. So we learn we have to go in these suburbs, to go in these streets, to involve street workers, social workers, to involve um, uh, people, um, um, uh, local, um, lo local authorities and local in individuals to stay in contact to work with them on in round table meetings and really to listen what's going on in this support and maybe to uh, improve a uh, special situation and even to explain our vaccination policy, for example, um, uh, in face-to-face -face communication. This is one of our type of reaction um, where we try to, um, uh, where we try to, to, to reduce hate speech, uh, for example, uh, in the context of the, uh, of the pandemic. And uh, secondly, I think it's um, important that we, uh, um, uh, in the aspect of prosecution, for example, to work closer as local authority with the state police, for example, with prosecution state attorneys and with the courts. And um, this is uh, um, very, very helpful, so we can show that um, this hate speech is really a crime and is, or is really sentenced um, and punished, um, and it's not um, um, only an, uh, uh, an offense which is tolerated more or less by, uh, by the state uh, administration. Thank you. And the last question of this round will go both to Mr. Balcerzyk and Mr. Jan Olbricht. How can local authorities notify the EU institutions with regards to the aggravation of the situation in terms of hate speech and polarization? What channels do exist for regular dialogue between the EU and the local level? Maybe Mr. Balcerzyk. Thank you. Um, so, um, there are there are different channels where we where we try to um, to, to to work together, and also on different levels. Um, I mentioned uh, dialogues with member states within the council. Uh, I mentioned this high-level group, where authorities from member states are present, um, and of course, 
in Polish situation, it's, it's probably would be difficult to work with, with national authorities, but in other countries, it is a way of uh, local authorities through, um, through um, member states also to provide their input. Um, we have, and I probably hear uh, say something which, which um, um, Mr. Albrecht would like to say, um, but I mentioned European Parliament and uh, Comit Libe Committee, which is uh, the Committee for Justice and Freedoms and Rights. Um, and then this is an issue, one of the issues which Libe is dealing with, and you can always address them and um, provide them with information. Um, uh, we have EU agencies, I mentioned, um, uh, like Fundamental Rights Agency, like CEPOL, I mentioned, but also uh, institutions like OACD or <clears throat> Institution for um, Demo Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. All of them can be contacted and provided with information and analysis and uh, um, entered into cooperation. We have also um, some tools which are uh, EU specific and I would mention here citizens initiative. This is a possibility for a group of uh, European citizens from many member states under certain conditions to initiate or to force uh, um, commission and other EU institutions to deal with, with an issue. Um, so this is also a, a way for, for citizens and, and local authorities to, to, to go. And of course, contact with, with um, institutions like, um, um, like Committee of the Regions or European Social Committee, um, direct contact to, to members of European Parliament. Um, when I meet um, students or pupils throughout Poland, they are very often surprised that they can just write an email to their member of parliament and ask for something. Uh, this is something which I, you can, uh, I put on my responsibility as head of communication that there is still lots of work to do to, uh, to inform uh, citizens that their participation in democratic process is not only voting but they can participate and, and ask and force their representatives throughout the, uh, the, the legislative period. period. Um, and I mentioned uh, finally the European Year of Youth as um, this is, this is the, the, the 2022 is the European Year of Youth and within this year there is a possibility especially for young people to get involved to uh, to seek for for initiatives and projects which uh, can be then uh, funded under different uh, possible uh, European uh, uh, possibilities um, and this for example uh, Erasmus plus and yes, this would be the, 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 the channels I, I, I can think of. Thank you. Mr. Olbricht, would you like to add anything to this? Uh, you mean if I want to make the list a bit longer? Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> Give us the no, no, ways no, no, no. to contact the European no, no. Uh, institutions. No, I would just, to, I would like to be uh, uh, concrete is just, okay, there are several uh, channels, but there are different channels for different things. I think that if we have the, uh, the, the situation of a real crime, because we hope that it be identified as an EU crime, so the question is who should be alerted and who should have the information about this kind of crime. And of course, it's, it's not only to inform police and procure, etc., but also to, to make it visible that this is a growing danger, I mean, the risk. Uh, by the way, I think Rafael Czaskowski knows very well that this was a, uh, recently the action organized by the Committee of Regions concerning the hate speech against the local authorities. This, was, this is one of the elements that the local authorities uh, has been attacked. So I think it's, this is the, uh, a very clear example. Uh, so the, the question who should be alerted about it? And I think that, as I said, these institutions who are dealing with the crime. But also politically, it should be very, very clear because this hate is created for political reasons, but only for another reasons, for the local reasons. 
the 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 so uh, of course the uh, the other way is how who should be contacted what channels to get the help and to support in the programs of course in this this is the, this is different uh, is just looking for the kind of support and uh, uh, i think that um, what is very important are the associations of local authorities which are very active and different organization i mean efus is one of them but also the uh, cmr euro cities uh, they are very important and they, they are very clearly heard on the european level because they represent of course all of them are they have representatives in the committee of regions which is one of the eu institutions so it, it's true but you know this is a political institution because they, this is a, li a little bit different so all the channels which exist should be used but uh, not for symbolic contacts. I mean, the, the address, they should be addressed in a very clear situation. Some, some elements should be addressed to the European Parliament. We are a legislative body, so we are responsible for the legislation, but not only creating the law, but also to, to have a very clear voice as a democratic body, what is going on, and to, and for example, through the resolution to, um, uh, to, to to show the opinion what we cannot accept on the European level. So first, of course, the, uh, the, um, the institutions which can um, fight the crime, this is one element, and the, to, uh, to use all the existing organization. I mean, Europe, uh, the Union of Polish Metropolis is very active on European level. So I think that's, that's why I think it should be used for these reasons that I know. But for example, that we were discussing there, as uh, four cities for European uh, Union, uh, they made the activities. I mean, Warsaw, Gdańsk, Poznan, and uh, Białystok. And the very, very interesting actions uh, 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 which should be then. I know that uh, I know that the Union is cooperating with EFUS. So I think that these are the, 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 the channels which should be used. I'm, uh, uh, I think that the, the remark concerning the Parliament is absolutely clear. And I think I'm very glad that the, the European Commission shows that the European Parliament is also important. So I, I welcome it. But, uh, uh, but I think that uh, we should be uh, one of the channels which should be used. But let's, uh, let's make the, the channels very well addressed and uh, not to uh, use them just for symbolic actions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would like to encourage the audience in the studio to ask their questions. Um, please introduce yourself and ask whoever you want. Go ahead. Hello. Oh, wonderful. The microphone is working. Um, hello, my name is uh, Daria Oneshko. I am from European Democracy Youth Network that brings together 23 countries, uh, youth from those countries in Europe. And I'm originally from Ukraine, so thank you very much for, for your support uh, to my country in these difficult times. But uh, my question would be youth-related, actually, and um, I think it's very important discussion about the hate speech and polarization, and we all know that dialogue is one of the effective means on how to tackle this polarization. And actually, uh, during, sorry, and uh, actually, I was reviewing some research and uh, recently NDI had good findings that um, the number of young people that contact politicians just with some requests is very low, including the local level. And I also heard some um, thoughts that even those who contact politicians, they don't get these responses. So um, what are the, the initiatives that at the local level that provide for such an opportunity to uh, communicate with politicians? And this would be probably a question to, uh, to the city's representatives as we already discussed it at the European level. Thank you. Dobry dzień, привет. Uh, glad that you're with us. Uh, I mean, that's why, you know, I mean, there are different channels that of course uh, in both of our instances and, and, and more, you can simply direct yourself to our offices and we try to respond. We are very active on social media, so wherever you know, I, I receive questions on Facebook uh, and they're concrete, uh, then we are trying to engage. But because I agree with you, that's why I started this project, uh, the future, Campus, the Future of Poland, where we 
selected a thousand people, uh, the most active from all over Poland, uh, and we've organized this campus last year to talk to them for a week, and we were all there for the whole week to actually talk about the different challenges, hate speech among them. And we are going to continue uh, both, uh, we, we will organize a few regional meetings, but then we'll do another, another, another campus in, in August. That's how, how we want to engage. And not only to listen, uh, but, but also to have this engagement and then later on to translate what the young people tell us into our policies. Thank you for this question, and um, we really cross fingers for, 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 for Ukraine uh, independence, and uh, we have friends here uh, in Poland and in Gdansk also. Mm, very briefly, um, I would just add uh, one thing, um, one example from yesterday, uh, and I was really shocked because one of the girls uh, had a 15th birthday, and her dream was to meet me and to ask me several questions so I don't know how my assistant or my secretary did it because she just arrived to my office and we had nice talk for half an hour so first of all you need to be very open especially for young people because I deeply believe that um, you are the future because I, I do remember when I was, I don't know, 14 or 15 or 16 years uh, old, someone also was very open to me and, uh, and really, gave me, uh, really gave me a hand and um, answered to my questions, talked to me and treat me seriously. So uh, this is uh, quite, quite important. Of course, we have different programs like, I don't know, we are European Capital of Volunteering um, for 2020. To. This is also one of the ways where you can uh, meet active people and somehow also um, make them closer to public life, uh, make them more, um, to be more interested into public life, but also to show them that they can really have uh, some power and some, uh, some influence. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question? Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, my name is Maximilian Ciszkowski. I'm a chairman of the Youth Council of the capital city of Warsaw. And I want to say that it's very visible nowadays in Europe that various organizations, especially extremists, very easily attract a big part of young people. I'm 18 years old, and when I have talked with my friends, uh, during the la latest few years, I have in increasingly noticed that, that they, are, they are fascinated in populist, even revolutionary and aggressive slogans and people. And my question is, how can we fight with these inclinations among youth, even from the earliest years, but from this also basic local level and European? Thank you. Well, I think it's all natural that, you know, when you're young, you, you, you want uh, clear messaging and, and sometimes you're attracted to, uh, to people who are, who are tough in their opinions. And that's what happened in my youth as well. Uh, and, you know, I have kids at home and, and it is quite, quite normal that, you know, they're either way to the left or way, way to the right. Uh, and it's not a question of fighting it, it's a question of having an open debate because I, I think that there's nothing wrong with people who support parties on the far left or even who find uh, you know, uh, interesting slogans in people who are very conservative. It's just a question of explaining to them that there are certain bounds of an open discussion, that you shouldn't fall into hate speech, whatever you do, that you shouldn't stigmatize people, that you shouldn't attack anyone, that there are certain rules of the debate. And of course also, uh, and all I was talking about it all the time, and, 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 and me as well, of uh, educating people, having an open discussion, because people simply do not, young people, and I know it from experience, do not really realize uh, th uh, what's, you know, what are the consequences of what they do on the net. I mean, it is very difficult to come to a person and start attacking him and telling him you know, uh, bad and negative things. Uh, it's much easier to do it when, when you are on the net and when no one knows who you are. So first of all, it's a question of 
as I've said, mechanism on social media that you cannot do things anonymously, that you cannot set up 50 accounts and simply do it. I mean, you know, I've, sometimes I check when I see really aggressive comments. Sometimes I check, and it turns out that 95% of that, those are like uh, accounts with maybe one or two messages. I mean, you know, it's clear that these are not, not that, that these are not people, that they, these have been mechanically constructed in order to attack us. And have an open debate at schools, uh, meet with people, and, and, and simply also uh, be not afraid of some of those questions when they're being asked. The politicians have this tendency of disregarding difficult questions, or if they come from the left or from the right, you know, sort of, ah, you know, no, you should engage. And when you do, I, I think that that's the only way uh, which, which could lead to a, to a more open debate and, and to explaining to people that maybe, you know, uh, their choices should be re rethought because maybe some ideas are fine, but look what kind of people are behind those ideas uh, and whether they are not just cynical populists, whether th those are the people who really mean something. And even on, on, in conservative circles or in the far light, left circles, you can find people who really mean something. And you can also find cynical populists who are just playing this game and attacking people. So it's just a question of an open debate to explain uh, and to give, give tools to the young people to be able to discriminate between the two. Good afternoon. My name is Lomakov Kak um, National Democratic Institute. Uh, I have a question reg regarding like the atmosphere and and like the narrative. So according to the recent researches done um, uh, conducted by the research institute in Slovakia, Poland, and also Hungary, shows that like the anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and homophobia, they are very politicized and uh, they are used as a tool to attack those democratic voices. Uh, to destroy their credibility. And in the terms of uh, public administration, like uh, on the local level, uh, how you can just take over that narrative, which is increasing the polarization when your uh, credibility is being under attack. Thank you. Well, <laughs> well um, you are looking at me, so, uh, so maybe I should... Um reply well this is not easy if it would be easy we will not have i don't know so many discussions or well, how to tackle this uh, problem i think that um, all those small steps um, which are done at the european level um, okay, we could also say that uh, we have a problem in some countries at the national level, like in Poland or in Hungary, that uh, we, we don't have actually any actions to support the um, equal treatment, human rights, good atmosphere, supporting values and so on and so on. Mm, and we have to do what we have to do at our regional and local level. Um, we all feel responsible, also I'm looking at uh, Ms. Kim, also at media, because uh, this is also the job for, for media, not only uh, us uh, politicians or those who are working at the, at the public, uh, public service. Um, I think that we are living in uh, difficult times, difficult times uh, not only regarding the crisis, uh, the political crisis, economical crisis, health crisis, but also the whole situation with um, social media, what we were talking about, and um, and actually, well, lack of control of this, what could be spread widely, um, is an issue. Um, if we will not really support the um, actions which are um, invent by the European Commission, by the local leaders and so on and so on, it will be even worse. So on the one hand, we see many actions that could create better atmosphere. And I also deeply believe uh, in young people who are my, much more open and much more in general aware of the general situation than, 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 than we think. I, mean, I, I think I think that you've asked a, a very pertinent question. I mean, w uh, you know, we are dealing with populists. We are dealing with cynical populists. They're looking for people to attack because they need an enemy. That's what they do. That's their modus operandi. 
I mean, they started with refugees, then they went on to LGBT community and so on and so forth. Difficult for them to be openly anti-Semitic, so they support, you know, with huge money, uh, such, uh, such organizations, which are. And they're doing it on purpose. I always, I always say that if they found that, you know, uh, attacking chim chimney sweepers would be uh, something that you can get uh, people galvanized on and get some political capital, they would do it. And now it's a question of having balls to actually oppose that. And the problem is that many politicians don't. I mean, all of my advisors were telling me, political advice, don't touch LGBTQ issues, don't touch refugees, because you're not, I mean, there's no political capital to gain. And then if politicians have balls to actually, you know, uh, talk about it and, and protect minorities and fight with, with those who attack uh, whomever they attack, uh, then that's the only thing we can do. And there are not too many mainstream politicians who do it. And it is rather the local mayors who do, most of my colleagues do it. You know, we are not afraid of doing it. And now the question is, then we are branded as leftists. You know, our job as, as uh, local mayors is to stand with those who are weaker. You know, I always say it, I mean, if big white boys, you know, skinheads, Catholic and so on, will be attacked in Poland, we'll be with them. Somehow they're not. I mean, it is the minorities which are being attacked. And it's, it has nothing to do with, with the fact whether we are uh, on the left or on the right or in the center. It's just a question of our job. I mean, if someone is attacked, I mean, we are with the minorities. We are with the ones who, who need help. And that's the only thing we can do. Uh, but if we do it vocally enough, and, and if it's not just pronouncements, but when we help these minorities, then you know there, there is an ability of, of all of us to actually stand in truth and, and, and defend the values that we believe in. And again, the atmosphere in Poland and in Hungary is not good. I mean, you know, look at the xenophobic incidents, people being attacked because they speak a different language, people being attacked because they have a different color of skin, people being attacked because they hold hands or have a, a rainbow flag. It's not happening on its own. I mean, it's because of the hate campaigns, which are organized by the state, by the political party. Uh, and that's why, you know, the opposition politicians need to do something about it. Even when we hear, uh, you know, by pundits, oh, you lost the election because you, you said things that shouldn't... Screw them. I mean, I mean, why are we there in politics? I mean, we are there in order to, to mean something and to stand for something. And if someone doesn't believe that, you know, pff, let them go and change the job. Thank you very much. I think this is a perfect um, summary of this discussion. Uh, thank you all the speakers. Uh, I hope we'll come out of here uh, with more knowledge how to fight and prevent and mitigate uh, hate speech and polarization. Um, I just want to add one thing that uh, I found out while reading the documents of the European Union about the bridge project that was mentioned here. Um, one of the speakers during the May uh, last year conference of Bridge Project uh, said that fighting the polarization is all about fighting for uh, equality. That if you have equality and uh, all the um, people are taken care of and feel equal, uh, it helps you fight polarization and um, hate speech. And I think we can, uh, we can say goodbye at this point. Thank you very much.